I should be happy that the room is full. On the other hand, there's so many people who want to know how to corrupt databases. <laughs> they should, they should uh, be unemployable, guys. Yeah. But then maybe you came for the second part of the talk where I tell you <laughs> there's an excuse. OK, before I start the talk, uh, the usual words about me and the company I work for, I was already introduced. I don't have to say anything about that. Uh, we are all, all over the world, uh, based in Austria. We do support training, consulting, you name it. We have a couple of nice uh, products that you might want to use and buy. And we have a couple of nice customers that we like and that like us, and I guess that's good enough. OK, so uh, first I got to define what I'm talking about. What I'm uh, talking about when I mean data corruption. That can be several things. It could be errors that start with two X's, like data corruption errors. Or it could be that you get crashes of your database when you run certain selects. Or it could be that you don't get crashes, but uh, your data is inconsistent. Your foreign keys are violated. Uh, not all of your table rows are indexed, stuff like that. Or it could just be that you do a select and uh, out comes a value that you never entered and it was never added by anybody, something broken in the data. What I'm not talking about is uh, something that is consistent but bad, like you dropped the table or you dropped your database. Well, it's not good, but that's not data corruption. So what could be causes of data corruption? Well, most often it's bad hardware, disk, memory, stuff like that. It could be software bug in the operating system, file system. It could be in Postgres. Uh, but what I'm going to focus on is bad administrators, so the problem is behind the keyboard. Uh, now, Postgres tries to be foolproof, but fools are always better. And there are a couple of things what you, we can do things wrong, and that's what I'm going to talk about. OK, so number one is f-sync equals off. I think it has been mentioned in a talk before. You probably know what I'm talking about. Uh, Postgres doesn't directly write to disk yet. May come, yeah. Uh, does buffered right, so we have to flush out data during checkpoints at commit time to maintain consistency. Uh, yeah, there are a couple of ways you can do that, but it's necessary for the consistency. For example, wall always has to be written before the data, stuff like that. Now, if you turn that off, your performance will be much, much better. I ran a trivial uh, PG bench and it was 2.5 times as fast. So, and everything will be great until you happen to have an operating system crash and then your database is toast. So don't do it. Yeah. There is no reason ever to do that. If you need the benefit without the penalty, uh, consider turning off synchronous commit. That will only uh, not do the wall flashes during commit. So. If you have an operating system crash, your database will come up, will be consistent. You maybe have lost a couple of commits, but you're good. OK, the next way to easily break a database is with a backup. Now I'm talking about file system backups here, a copy of all the files which is, of course, consistent if your database is down, but if the database is running, the files will be inconsistent, and you need to do recovery. You need to recover from the beginning of the backup to the end of the backup, at least, so that all the files are consistent again. Yeah? Now, a very important role in this place, the backup label file, that's part of every backup, because that backup label file contains the location of the checkpoint that started the base backup. Yeah? And it's the only way that Postgres can tell a backup from a crash data directory. Otherwise, they look the same. So, uh, yeah. 
what happens if a uh, backup label is missing? Yeah? Uh, then Postgres will think, oh, this is a crash data directory. It will look for the control file, look for the checkpoint in the control file, but the control file was back up way after the start of the backup, perhaps, and some checkpoints have run in between, and you recover from a bad position. Yeah? If you're lucky, that'll fail with an error. If you're not lucky, it will succeed, yeah? and you have a broken database. Yeah, how could that uh, surface? Yeah, like two tables are not in sync, foreign keys are violated, indexes and uh, data, every, anything can happen. It's just wonderful. Okay. So why would a backup label file ever get missing? Yeah. Now there are a couple of reasons. One, a very frequent one, is that you never created one, you know, people just perform a regular file system backup and hope that's good enough, you know, and it isn't. Uh, then some smart people deliberately remove backup label because they don't want to undergo all this difficult recovery configuration and I mean, yeah, it starts up, hey, great, you know. Nah. And the third method is if you use the low-level backup API, you know? Uh, in Postgres 15, the old exclusive backup API was removed. That created a backup label file in your data directory, and so nothing could go wrong on that account, but other things could go wrong, so it was decided to remove that backup API. I was against it, but nobody listened. And with the current API, it is like this. Uh, you don't get the backup label in the data directory, but a PG backup stop outputs something, and you have to take the output of PG backup stop, put that in a backup label file, and add it to the backup. That's how you perform a correct backup. Now, it's of course very easy not to do that. Yeah. There you go. So, recommendation, of course, use a backup tool, yeah? like PG base backup or PG backrest. They do it right. Don't try to knit something yourself. Okay, the next uh, popular method to break a database is PG Reset Wall. Now, it is really not an end user tool. It is a tool for a specialist to repair a corrupted database. And that is because it usually introduces more data corruption. It it is a last-ditch effort that you can make to start a server that does not start otherwise, yeah? But it will wreck your database. In particular, if the database was not shut down cleanly, yeah? You get a message then, the database server is not shut down cleanly, use minus F, you know, and people, oh, okay, then use minus F, yeah, and there you go, broken database. There are ways, there are times when you can use it safely, for example, you can use it to change the wall segment size if you've shut down your server cleanly. <laughs> so, yeah, don't, don't touch it, yeah. Yeah, obviously, you run it with minus F. So, why do people do that? I mean, reset wall, it's on those walls, and if you get some error message during startup that says something with wall or, you know, your replication breaks and uh, wall file has been removed or any strange message with wall, oh, obviously, yeah, let's, let's reset wall, you know. I think that's the reason why. I don't really know, you know, you ask people, why did you corrupt the database? What? I, I don't know. I don't know, people, people don't tend to not admit it. Pardon? Yeah, it sounds nicer than it is. Yeah, it's true, yeah. Maybe we should give it a different name. Yeah. Okay, the next nice way to corrupt the database is PG upgrade minus minus link. Now, the trick behind that is to start two servers on the same files. Yeah? Normally, you can't do that. There are good protections in place. There's a shared memory segment, there's the postmaster PID file. It's very, very difficult to start two servers on the same data directory. But fortunately, we have PG upgrade, minus minus link. 
And uh, that works by having only one copy of the data files. And you have two clusters that point to the same files you know, with hard links. That's very fast during upgrade. It's great. But you must remove the old cluster because they both reference the same files. <laughs> PG upgrade adds a safeguard. It renames the control file from the old cluster so that you cannot accidentally start it. But it's very easy to undo that renaming yeah, and start both servers, and there you go. Yeah, so don't do that. Now we're getting to more crude methods of breaking a database. Yeah. Messing with the data director is usually deleting files from PG Wall. Uh, there are certain error scenarios, you know, your archiver gets stuck, you have a stale replication slot, and uh, files keep piling up in PG Wall. Eventually, your database crashes because the disk fills up, and somebody, well, obviously, there's a lot of redundant files in the directory, deletes those files, and of course, if you want to do crash recovery, you need wall, and so you delete it exactly what you would have needed to recover, and you made a small problem into a big problem. We're getting to even cruder methods to break your database. People uh, sometimes modify catalogs, not for fun, but because they want to take shortcuts. I just cooked up two random examples. Like, for example, you want to drop a column, which is a very short operation in Postgres, yeah? just a metadata manipulation, but it requires a short access exclusive log. So if you have long running transactions all the time, that may not work. You know. You might think maybe, why well, just delete uh, from PG attribute, which is the table of columns. But it won't work because the column is still there and your metadata won't match your data. And yeah. Or uh, even more interesting, change the data type. Yeah? Well, it's, it's just update. Yeah? <laughs> it normally would require a rewrite. I mean, these seem ridiculous. They are much smarter methods. I don't know. For example, you can update PG database and change your collation or so, you know. So that, that, I, I, there's unlimited ways to break a database with catalog updates. Okay, that was my showcases. Now, what do you do if it happened? Well, there's a few general pieces of advice. Don't continue working with the corrupted database. That may be painful because, you know, <laughs> you're losing money, you know. So, but don't do it because it can spread and also it can happen that all the data you add to the database are lost anyway because you can't recover the database. The second thing, consider restoring the backup. Yeah, I'll get to that in more detail later. The next thing, if you decide you want to deal with the data corruption somehow, Crash your database server, save everything that's on disk, because if we deal with data corruption, we usually destroy more data. And if you went down the wrong alley, you know, you might want to start again from scratch. And then, very important, if you have succeeded, you know, in removing whatever error or problem was there, don't continue working with that thing, you know, dump it and restore it, because there might still be something lurking somewhere. Yeah. And of course, yeah, try to figure out what went wrong so that it doesn't happen again. That's like general. Yeah, uh, let me sing the praise of backups. Well, everybody takes backups, but there's one warning I might add. If you do not monitor the backups, there are no backups. Uh, I've seen cases where people had data corruption, and so they want to went to, for the backup, and the backup was a daily PG dump. Now that daily PG dump fell over right where the data corruption was, and it had fallen over for the past two weeks, and there was no backup. So that's no good. Yeah, uh, and concerning that, usually a PG dump is better if you deal with data corruption, because it's just a logical dump. So if you manage to restore it somewhere, you're good. No more data corruption. On the other hand, uh, physical Backup may allow you to do point in time recovery right to the time before the problem happened, if you know when it happened. 
So both are cool, and if you're paranoid, which is a virtue for a database administrator, do both, you know, do your regular file system backup and maybe once a week or once a month run a PG dump, just, it's nice. <laughs> yeah, well, obviously, how to recover with a good backup is not a problem. Uh, but really give it serious thought, because that's something that everybody can do. It's cheap. Yes, you lose data. Yes. Yeah, but you may lose data anyway, yeah? Because you never know if you can deal with the data corruption. So this is the safe route. It doesn't require an expens expensive expert to do it for you and help you. Okay, if you still want to try it, then my advice is to first think how much time and how much money and how much effort do I want to sink into that, yeah? Because you can never know, yeah? And stick to your guns here. If the three days have expired without you making any progress, give up, yeah? It's so tempting, ah, we've worked for three days, let's invest one more day and then maybe one more day and you're throwing good money after bad and, yeah, at one point you have to stop. Okay, now I'm going to deal with the various cases of data corruption, starting with the nicest one. Index corruption means that the index is inconsistent within itself, like the ordering is wrong, stuff like that, or uh, that the table doesn't match the index. Very, very, very often this is caused by uh, something being mutable, when it should have been immutable, like you used an immutable function that turned out not really to be immutable, or you changed your collations by an operating system upgrade, stuff like that, tends to break indexes. Yeah, the symptoms are that the results are different whether you're using index scans or sequential scans, so you can play around and determine that. There's the very useful AM check extension to check indexes, which offers two functions, PT index check and PT index parent check. The latter is more thorough, but requires a higher lock on the table. Both have an optional heap all indexed uh, argument, which you can use to check if the index and the table are in sync. So that's useful. Recovering from index corruption is thankfully very easy because it's redundant data, so you just rebuild the index and you're good. Yeah? Uh, maybe you're not good because it doesn't work, but then you've already got data corruption and you can't have a unique index because there are duplicate values in the table. Then, yeah, you've got to deal with that. It could be that an index on a catalog table is broken. Here you could start the server with minus capital P, which means ignore the system indexes, rebuild the system indexes, and there you go. So this is simple, really. Okay, the next case, data corruption that does not cause an error. Could be bad values during a select, could be mm, things that vanished because files suddenly are gone, you know, or I mean, truncated, whatever uh, blocks that are all zero could be from a file system check that went wrong or whatever. Yeah. Or duplicate data from an index corruption that we had earlier, stuff like that. It doesn't cause an error, but the data are wrong. Dealing with that is fairly simple. Yeah. Since you don't get an error, you can PG dump the database, great. And then you can restore it, great. If that works, you're done, yeah? If it doesn't work, well, maybe there's some duplicate data or the foreign keys don't work because they're inconsistent. Well, you got to add or delete some rows, you know. It's tedious work by hand, but it can be done until you can create your constraint and you're good. I mean, you've lost some data, but you always lose some data with data corruption, and usually you're happy if you just lose a few data. Yeah? And this will be what we're trying to reduce all the other cases to. You're trying to get your database so that you can dump it and restore it, and then you're good, you know? So you're trying to make the errors go away. Okay, that's the next case. Data corruption that causes error but does not crash the database. 
What could it be? It could be that the blocks are broken. If you have checksums enabled, it could be a checksum failure. Or it could be that the block header is broken, invalid page. Then it could be that the block itself looks okay from its header, but the data in the block are broken, the rows are broken. I wrote three potential error messages there. It could be that toast is corrupted. I'll tell more about that in a sec. So let's deal with those in turn. If you have corrupted blocks, there are parameters to deal with that. For checksums, you could say ignore checksum failure is on, then those will turn into warnings. But if the block is toast, you know, we'll still get an error message when you try to read it, of course. Then there's zero damaged pages, which makes Postgres uh, ignore, or uh, like think of corrupted blocks as being all zero, that is empty. So it doesn't throw an error, but treats it as empty. Now, uh, those don't change your data on disk. Yeah? So the block is still corrupted. You can fix the database by doing that. But you can get it to a place where you can dump it. And that's what we're trying to do. Yeah? Well, some data will be missing, but yeah, great. OK, that was corrupted blocks. Now, if you have toast corruption, what is toast for those who don't know that uh, storage of oversized attributes in out-of-line toast tables. And the actual table only has a pointer to the toast table. Uh, yeah, the, it's easy to tell because you get an error message with toast. Yeah, I had one earlier. Yeah, missing chunk for toast value, yeah, typical error. Yeah, and also, you can select from the table as long as you do not select a certain column from a certain row that's broken. Yeah? If you avoid the toasted value, it doesn't get detoasted, you don't get an error. Now, dealing with that is also not so difficult. The trick is to identify the rows that are broken, and then you can do a simple delete or update, and you're good. You've lost the value, but you're good. And how can you find your bad rows? I've, that's a sample. Uh, PLPGSQL script that just goes through all the rows in the table, tries to touch the bad value, and wherever you get an error, you just uh, put a message to the console that says, okay, this row is broken, this row is broken, that row is broken. Then you get a list of broken rows, which you can update or delete and make your database dumpable. Yeah, if rows are broken, so you select a certain row and you get an error, then it's a very similar, but now you cannot like select the primary key or you cannot touch the row. If you try to touch the row, it's broken. So it's very similar script, except that I have to guess primary key values. So if it's a numerical primary key, that's pretty straightforward. I just take the maximum value and the minimum value and then I loop through them and try to select the rows and wherever it goes boom, you know, I just report that primary key. And how do you deal with that? You try to delete the rows. If the delete doesn't work, you go the other way and you select everything except the bad rows from the table and copy it elsewhere. Yeah, there is a tool that I want to tell you about this PG surgery that came in Postgres version 14. It's a low level functions that can uh, allow you to make an invisible row visible and uh, a visible row invisible. Yeah. Of course, it's also a great tool to break a database. I didn't tell that in the first part of the talk. But where can you use that? For example, to turn back to the error messages. The last could not access status of transaction, whatever. That's probably some broken xmin or xmax value in your row, you know. And if you just say, this row is invisible, don't bother, you know, then the error will be gone. So that's what you could use PG surgery for. Yeah, but yeah, handle with care, leave it to the expert, I would say. Uh, yeah, 
Okay, next step. You get a crash if you do certain selects. Now, uh, yeah, there's a couple of general things. This shouldn't happen, you know. Postgres shouldn't crash, period, should it? Yeah. If it's defensively and safely programmed, it shouldn't. But you cannot check everything all the time, everywhere, because uh, that would probably tank uh, performance. You can try to use an assert enabled build that will still crash, yeah, but it might give you some kind of message that tells you what is wrong. So, yeah, both don't really fix the problem, but maybe give you a clue. So, how do you deal with those? I mean, the procedure is really the same. Uh, the only problem is you cannot do it in a simple PGSQL script because if the database crashes, well, the execution is terminated. So you'll have to use client code. You'll have to write some code that just connects to the database, tries to select all the rows in turn, and whenever it goes boom, you know, it outputs the row number and reconnects and goes on. It's more tedious. You have to write some client code, but the essential procedure is the same. Yeah, now, all the time I've been talking of deleting rows, you know, zeroing out blocks, yeah. They, they might contain valuable data, but, you know, if you can somehow live without those data, do, because uh, digging into a broken block to try and salvage some data is really painful, and you normally you have to extract the page, the Page inspect extension is useful there. You can get the 8K page out of the database and see what you can find in there. Yeah? Uh, there are methods as ePage item atlas, which reads uh, the data out of the block. But you know, if the data are broken, it will probably also fail. Yeah? And same with PG file dump. Yeah, so very, very likely you just have to look at the binary data and, you know, read your Postgres headers and try to figure out what salvageable data is in there. Yeah? If you really want to do that, only do that if it's very, very important for you. Yeah. Uh, missing or empty files, how could that happen? Yeah, of course, somebody could have deleted them. Uh, like the wall segment, it could be that uh, your F-Sync said, yes, everything's on disk, but really, you know, actually there were a few blocks missing, stuff like that. A file system check could uh, leave a file empty or, you know, stuff like that. And of course, it could be that some antivirus software carefully decides that this data file is dangerous and should be uh, quarantined. Or, so yeah, you shouldn't do that. Now, if the files are table or index data files, it's easy, drop the object and the problem is gone. Yeah, I mean, the data are gone anyway. <laughs> yeah. If it's missing wall segments, we already had that, you know, you can reuse PG reset wall. Yes, you're going to lose some data, but you're going to get something that you can dump and try to restore. Yeah, sometimes you can fake some data. Yeah? Uh, the example that I wrote here is commit log. Yeah? If you're missing commit log files, there was an error message before. The same we dealt with. Um, so what you can do is you can create a commit log file that just contains all committed. Yeah? Five is two committed transactions. So you just fill it with committed. Yeah? Then everything becomes visible. You can select, you can dump. But of course, also all your deleted rows will be in the dump. So there will be a lot of garbage in there, but you get something, you know, rather than an error message, which can be better than nothing. Okay, so what is the important messages? Yeah, th there are certain things you shouldn't do. That was the first part of the talk. Uh, again, Backups are your friend, and try it. If you want to be safe from data corruption, as safe as you can, do both physical and logical backups. Yeah, only 
deal with corruption if it's really necessary. If you can, by all means, restore your backup. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Before you start, save everything you have. Use the nice tools like PG Reset Wall, PG Surgery, Page Inspect, and never continue working with the repaired database. Dump it and restore it. I know it's painful, it takes a long time, but you want to be safe. Okay, yeah, that's all from my side. Thank you so much. That was great. I know all about how to corrupt my database now. I can't wait to get started. <laughs> Do we have questions? Hello. Um, how can, you, um, can I reproduce index corruption exactly so I can, uh, I can check it after that, oh, it is corrupt? I would like to play with it. First. Can you repeat? How can I reproduce index corruption? That if this I am check, I will find this index after that. Well, uh, just take a file system backup, not a proper backup, and restore it, or you know, all these things, you know, to run a PG reset but wall. Only index. I would like to have only index corruption. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, it, what, you, what you could do, you know, what you could do is you just uh, identify which is the file behind your index. You back, uh, you copy that file away, you do some more inserts, updates and deletes on the table, you shut it down and you overwrite the file with the old file, you know, then you have an old state of the index and the new state of the table and they are out of sync. That's one possibility. Uh, thank you for the talk, it was uh, very good. I've made a career of repairing corrupt databases myself, so uh, I think your tips are very good. Uh, also, you. understanding data corruption is uh, lucrative, so. Yeah, but it's painful too. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. It's hard earned money. Yeah. <laughs> uh, another answer to the question that was just made is uh, this uh, AM check, which has a test suite, and that test suite con contains instruction to corrupt uh, tuples, which can be used as a Ah, as a template useful. to corrupt mm -hmm. other indexes. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to mention that uh, because I was repairing one corrupted database uh, this summer, uh, there is also error that uh, ID of transaction for some row cannot be found. Uh, and uh, it is in case when uh, header of uh, that page is actually okay, uh, but uh, only some data inside data page uh, are corrupted. Yeah, like this could not access status of transactions, this the one you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, it is phrased slightly differently because uh, uh, it uh, tries to find if there is, uh, uh, because that the number uh, if uh, data inside data page are corrupted, then the, that's the X min number is like some random. And then you will see slightly different phrased message about uh, transaction ID not being able to uh, be found. Uh, actually, uh, how to test it, I, I wrote simple Python script, uh, which uh, damaged uh, either the whole data page or data inside data page on my on testing lab. And uh, this way you can reproduce all types of uh, errors you want, so like on, uh, on everything, on indexes, yeah, those tables. You can tables do a DD and, yeah. from def random to some nice block in the middle yeah, of it. But, but it's a really good learning experience because we had all these errors you mentioned by that client yeah. uh, because he had uh, encrypted uh, uh, file system and it, uh, it crashed. Okay, there was anything readable? No, that's uh, lucky. Yeah, yeah, we saved like 80% of data. Mm. Yeah. But uh, using all those methods you mentioned, actually. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Seti has a question. Right. Uh, 
Thank you so much. Um, actually, I uh, have a question because in my company, people who were very diligent uh, corrupted like a piece of database and I think it's Postgres problem, not our problem. So I will tell you how. Uh, so uh, the, uh, there was one like long running materialized you refresh and it happened to start before they started uh, PG backup and it was done perfectly. A and long running what? Ma materialized view, materialized ah, yes. view refresh. Mm -hmm. So it started before the backup started and it did not finish until the backup ended. So in this case, unfortunately, it's nothing in the walls and this uh, materialized view uh, leaves some debris and why we needed it, we uh, restore this backup for the development environments and you can neither drop it nor recreate it because there are some parts in the uh, system tables. Oh. Yeah, so we spent quite a bit of time. Was it a concurrent refresh? Or not uh, no, no, concurrent? no, it was, no, it was not re refresh. It was like backup start, like backup end, and this backup did had corrupted version of this materialized you. So when we restored it, uh, there was no way to, we could not recreate it. So basically because of this one, we had to bring uh, the, all the copy and uh, like, you know, play with this. Because this, uh, because of this and developers needed this materialized view, it became completely unusable. You couldn't drop it anymore? No, it cannot drop and cannot recreate, yeah. No. So that is something which I kind of like well, that, raising that's, a complaint. That's when you start <laughs> deleting from system catalogs and hope you get everything. Uh, so so you, you suggest <laughs> we should hack the catalog in this case. Now, <laughs> if you know what you're doing, you know. <laughs> As long as PG Dump runs, you know, you're good. You're restoring it anyway. <laughs> so, a couple more questions. Thank you for the very good talk. I have uh, one question. Which kind of data corruptions replicate to a replica? Are all of them replicated or some of them may be replicated? And some well, if you delete the file on the primary, that doesn't get replicated, but many things do, and in particular, even if it's something that's not replicated, you know, you change the state in your primary, you do some more data modifications, and those will replicate, so it spreads, typically. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, uh, in my company, we have a really weird case of corruption. Uh, we think that we know when it happened, we have a, a hardware problem, long time ago, but it was not noticed by the way. Uh, we have one table that only has one record with two columns. And every time that uh, the auto vacuum, or even the vacuum starts, it fails with an et error because uh, it has a tuple, tuple wrong error. Yeah. You could like uh, use PG surgery to get rid of it, but if it's only one yeah, row, select it, drop, yeah, recreate. That, that's yeah. The yeah, issue. Yeah, so yeah. we had we first create table has with the value from that table, and the new table also got the same error. We created a new table with the same value, and mm -hmm. the table got the same error. And it's happening only with that table. Well, it, it, it's surprising. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, but uh, I would need to see the error so message the, to say the anything. Error, the error yeah. appears when we create a new table. Mm. Uh, the table works okay, we can do the vacuum, but since it's a, a parameter table, we try to drop the other and rename this one, and then we got again the error. You don't remember the error, do you? Uh, no, it's one of those ed sets, zero one. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. Okay. It's the one about, I'm, I know what it is. X Men from before, Ralph Rose and XID, something like that. that. It's that one, right? Okay. Yeah, there you go. So that's what. It, it's it, Andres. So if you select and insert, that's. I, I, well, over. What, what you described seems very strange, and I don't, I know, I'm not saying I know what happened, but I'm almost certain that that was there. I mean, you, you agree with me, so obviously mm. it's not right. Um, so basically, there was. There was a bug that was dubbed Freeze the Dead. It's got a very catchy name. And um, as part of that, the effort to fix that, this was in 2017, Andres wrote hardening, and it would catch this issue and ones like it. So you're seeing this exact piece of hardening um, for what it's worth. Is that the question? Yeah. 
I, I don't think we questions. can resolve it here. Yeah. <laughs> Are there any more questions? Oh, of course it's the other side of the room. Oh, what's it? Where was it? Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I've been using Postgres quite heavily for a number of different companies for nearly a decade. And up until about half an hour ago, I was reasonably comfortable. It was fairly reliable. Um, I'm now a little bit scared. Um, maybe I've just been lucky in my companies. We haven't had too many issues. Yeah. I mean, obviously, a lot of good advice about how to recover and how not to uh, deal with these scenarios. Anything about... Anything to avoid corrupting your databases, or is that a completely different talk? In the in the in, yeah, in yeah. are these problems very obscure and only you see them so frequently because you're a Postgres consultant? Yes, there is. There's the opposite of uh, survivor bias for people in my position. I always see the databases that have problems. I don't see the 99.9% .9 of databases that never give you trouble. So <laughs> don't think that you know. Yeah, yeah. So I think it's a good system. Yeah. <laughs> Do we have any more questions? If not, I want to say thank you to Lawrence. I do have an uh, announcement from the organizers afterwards, so don't run away after we've given Lawrence a really big round of applause. Thank you.